Okay, and now I have the immense, immense privilege of introducing our final keynote speaker of the weekend, Ellie Hidalgo. <laughs> Ellie, as she walks up, I'm gonna share a little bit about her. Uh, Ellie is the co-director of Discerning Deacons, a project that engages Catholics in the active discernment of our church about women and the diaconate. Discerning Deacons is deeply engaged in the global synod process and Ellie is committed to serving this bold prophetic vision of a synodal church that walks together as the people of God in our faith-filled struggles for justice, dignity, and peace. She previously served as the pastoral assistant at Dolores Mission Catholic Church and School for 12 years. Dolores Mission is a Jesuit parish in the Latin American immigrant community of Boyle Heights, just east of downtown LA. And this small church with a giant heart is known for its restorative justice ministries and faith-based community organizing, and for being the home parish of Homeboy Industries and Father Greg Boyle. Ellie holds degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and Loyola Marymount University. Inspired by the prophetic role of grandmothers, mothers, women, and girls in bringing forth God's dream for God's people on earth, Ellie has also preached for the Catholic Women Preach series in 2018 and 2020, so you can look those up too. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Ellie Hidalgo. Thank you, Lisa, and I ascend for inviting me to be here with you all today. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm just back from three weeks in Rome, Italy, got back Thursday night, where I and a couple of delegations from Discerning Deacons participated in the public activities of the Global Synod on Communion, Participation, and Mission. And for those of you wondering what synod means, it's a fancy ancient Greek word that essentially means a summit a meeting, an assembly of leaders to decide on the direction of the church and what is the Holy Spirit asking of us for the, you know, based on the signs of the times. So as somebody who worked in parish ministry for a dozen years, I was really happy that we could be there in Rome and offer educational resources and stories as the church considers increasing opportunities for women's leadership in our church. And so I wanna take this time to unpack what this month-long summit in Rome has been about with the delegates who included cardinals, bishops, women for the first time ever in a synod. <laughs> Deacons, priests, and even young adults who gathered to pray, dialogue, and discern how is the, how is the Holy Spirit inviting us to live out our faith in the third millennium. So what does this mean for you, for your peers, for your families? What's exciting about this historical time in our church? What still needs a lot of prayer and work? And what's the challenge and the opportunity? So I'm gonna, we're gonna unpack some of this and I'll offer uh, ideas for how we can become a beloved and boundless people walking together. Okay, so Pope Francis, you, all of you here, are an important part of how we become a boundless and beloved people walking together. Pope Francis has said, the young want to be protagonists of change. Through you, the future enters the world. I ask you to also be protagonists of this transformation. And protagonist basically means an agent of change, a co-creator a co with this church, somebody who can take action, put your faith into action. And so this afternoon, we met in one of the breakout sessions uh, with discerning deacons with some of you uh, to hear a little bit about what are some of your hopes for change. So I just wanna share a few things that we heard. And some of it is hopeful and some of it is challenging. As one woman said, the church I've been a part of my whole life, it's changing to look more like love. Someone else said, we want to make sure that people feel welcome, not just inclusion, but belonging in our church. Someone else said, as someone, as women in the church, we have filled the roles we have been given. 
but we desire and hunger for more, for more representation, for the opportunity to preach or speak in mass or other public settings. Another woman said, young people seem to have aged so young people seem to age out of active participation. For example, altar serving is not something you really do after a certain age, and yet there's, it's not always clear what else you could be doing and serving the church in leadership or in more ways. And then finally, young people have an interest, a strong interest in climate change. We just heard some incredible reflections on that. We're going to be the ones making decisions. Is it too late? So how are we going to become a boundless and beloved people walking together? Pope Francis and our synod leaders are developing some tools in the toolbox that I want to, to share with you. Okay, the first one is hashtag listening church. We want to become a church that knows how to listen to people. And that's a, one of the key ideas. Pope Francis has initiated what's become a three-year synod on communion, participation, and mission so that we can all be practicing how to become better listeners. And some of the questions are pretty simple but also profound. What's it like to be you? What's good? What's hard? What do you wish other people understood? And there are questions about our church. What do you love about our church? What's hard? What are your hopes for the future? But it's especially important to listen to people on the margins. This has been something that Pope Francis has been saying. Go to the peripheries. Go to the homeless shelters. Talk to your LGBTQ friends and family members, people who are divorced, people who are poor. You know, who are the people that get excluded in your community? Go out and listen to them. Because sometimes... The Holy Spirit speaks through the people of God, especially those on the margins that are talking, can talk back to the center. So when we exercise our listening muscles, we strengthen those muscles and we became, become capable of better discernment. What is the Holy Spirit asking of us in these times? Okay, another tool in the toolbox. Pope Francis said this at the World Youth Day in Portugal this summer. En la iglesia hay lugar para todos, todos, todos. In the church, there is room for everyone, everyone, everyone. Now, this is an aspirational statement, but this is the direction that he's trying to lead us in. Imagine a church where everyone can feel included. And what would that take? Okay, another tool in the toolbox, Caminando Juntos. Francisco has been so wonderful in, in uh, sharing that with us. Caminando, caminando, caminando hacia el sol. He sings it better than I do. <laughs> Artist Laura James created. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Artist Laura James created this postcard for Discerning Deacons to express this idea of walking together. And I'll make a little plug for our booth, because if you like it, you can come pick it up at our booth. And, um, but the idea is that we are walking from the peripheries, in this case, the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City, towards Rome. And we are on this synodal journey. So imagine uh, at the front is St. Phoebe. I'll tell you a little bit more about her a little bit. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Sarah Phoenician woman, Mary Magdalene, Jesus with the dove above, and the people of God. Caminando juntos, walking together. This is a critical piece of what it means to become a beloved and boundless people of God. And so our, we uh, organized Anna Robertson of uh, Discerning Deacons. She helped to organize a Discerning Deacons delegation of young adults to show up in Rome for the opening synod activities because Pope Francis was inviting young adults to come to the opening of the public synod activities, which included uh, um, events called Together to bring people, young adults together from Europe and from other parts of the world. And also an extraordinary, here, here's the opening uh, liturgy and the ecumenical service. It was an extraordinary historic 
ecumenical service that deserves more attention than it's gotten. So I'm going to tell you some of the first that happened in this service. This vigil marked the first ecumenical prayer vigil before a synod, inviting numerous leaders of the different Christian traditions to come together and pray for the synod. It was the first time this diverse of a group of Christian leaders met together in Rome, and it included men and women. And it was the first time that they all entered the altar space together. Even Pope Francis processed with the rest of these leaders, and they sat together at the same level. Okay, and some other extraordinary things about this synod. Uh, there's about 363 people who have participated. 75% of them are bishops, but then there's all these new folks that I was telling you about that have been included. And generally, synods happen in a theater style, but this is the first time that a synod is happening in round tables, where 10 to 12 people are sitting at a round table together taking turns listening to each other about some of the more challenging issues of our church. And at the round table, there's at least one or two women at every table, along with the young adults and the priests and the deacons and the other folks who are there to help the bishops with uh, the discernment. All right, three young adults uh, were named to this synod. Father Ivan Montelongo from the Diocese of El Paso, Texas. Any folks here from Texas? All right. Wyatt Olivas, a student at the University of Wyoming. He's 19 years old, the youngest Synod delegate. And Julia Oseca, a junior at St. Joseph's University. <laughs> In this photo, they asked Pope Francis, Pope Francis, why did you want a young adults here? And his answer was, to make a mess. <laughs> I think that was his way of saying, to make some good trouble. And then they said to him, well, we're asking a lot of questions. And he started laughing and said, that's good, good. Questions are good. Get people thinking with your questions. On a lighthearted note, uh, Wyatt uh, wrote, <laughs> a note to be excused from going back to class. The synod ends uh, today, actually, and he's supposed to be back in class, I think, by Tuesday, but he felt like he really needed a few days off. So anyway, he requested he be excused from class next week, and Pope Francis signed his note. Here's a photograph of most of the 54 women voting Synod delegates. <laughs> who by virtue of their baptismal dignity were invited to participate in the syn Synod as voting members and with the recognition that women are also co-responsible for the church's mission. And I really like, you know, when you bring this diverse of a group of people together with all this newness that's happening, uh, there's bound to be some tensions. And so I really appreciate this statement from the Instrumentum Laboris. Characteristic of a synodal church is the ability to manage tensions without being crushed by them, experiencing them as a drive to deepen how communion, mission, and participation are lived and understood. So there's a recognition that the tensions we live in the church and in the world, there's always the threat that we can feel overwhelmed and crushed by them. But the whole idea of the synod is how do we learn other ways of being so that we can manage our tensions and move forward together. So I'm going to share with you one of the key tools in the toolbox that our synod delegates have been practicing all month in Rome. It's called Conversations in the Spirit. Have any of you participated in Conversations in the Spirit? Just raise your hand. Okay, all right. I see some people. Excellent. And from hearing the Synod delegates talk about what they've been learning about this, uh, it, you know, they'll take up a topic, and some of the topics have been quite challenging, how to be a more inclusive church, 
how to be more welcoming of LGBTQ people, how to recognize the giftedness of women and their vocational calls by virtue of their baptism, and men, you know, dealing with war and poverty and climate change, and just the list goes on, some of the, the issues that they've been taking up. But what they do in these uh, conversations in the spirit is take time to identify convergences. In our group of 10 or 12, where do we have agreement? And then name the differences. Where do we disagree? And then to begin to raise the questions. You know, what questions do, do our disagreements raise? And then begin to identify a possible pathway forward. And I really like this because it's an invitation to not cancel each other out, not give in to polarization, but to actually figure out what is the one tiny step, even if it's small, that we as a group could take forward together. And then these, this time always included time for sacred silence, recognizing that the Holy Spirit is what really guides a synod and how do we make room in our hearts for silence to be able to really process what we're hearing and what, what, what's resonating. What is the Holy Spirit trying to tell us as we listen to other people? One of the main goals of the synod process, it's very dear to Pope Francis's heart, is to renew the diaconia of the church, to renew our mission in the world in light of the signs of the times, to put our faith into action, to make sure that prayer allows us to discern what is God asking of us next. And we know, you know, that it is grounded in Jesus' desire that we be good Samaritans to each other, helping those most in need in our communities, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus' invitation to give food to the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, visit the incarcerated. So I want to share with you part of why I'm so passionate about the hope of the Global Synod and uh, and I'm dedicating so much um, energy to growing the conversation in particular about women's participation in the church and increasing women's opportunity for leadership. And this comes from, um, well, before we go to that, I just wanna share with you, because people ask me, well, what can deacons do since we're talking about the diaconate? Uh, and deacons can preach, but the piece that's really critical is that deacons are called to direct the charitable and justice work of a parish and a community, to help animate diaconia in a community where you help the community respond to the needs that are being felt. Deacons can also baptize, celebrate weddings, and celebrate funeral services that can be particularly helpful at a time when uh, many of our parishes don't have enough uh, ministers who can do this. So let me just tell you a, a couple things about the parish that I was so honored to work in for 12 years, Dolores Mission in East Los Angeles. And uh, let's see how many of you have read Father Greg's books, either Tattoos on the Heart, Barking to the Choir, the whole language. Okay, a lot of people here. So then you know a little bit of what I'm going to say, that uh, in, the, in the 1980s, there were eight active gangs in this small neighborhood of East Los Angeles. There were migrants pouring in from El Salvador as the war, the Salvadoran Civil War was raging and, and with nowhere to go. There was all kinds of poverty and discrimination. And Father Greg becomes the youngest pastor of Dolores Mission, the youngest pastor of the whole Archdiocese of Los Angeles because nobody wanted to, to pastor there. Um, it was so dangerous. But he takes it on and he'll, he'll be the first to say that his Spanish was so poor, it was a migrant community mostly from Mexico and El Salvador, that he couldn't talk too much because he was, he was just starting to learn Spanish and his Spanish wasn't that great. So it meant he listened a lot. And as he listened to the needs in the community, he listened to a lot of mothers and grandmothers talking about, Padre, my, my children are on a track to the cemetery or to prison. 
what are we going to do about this? And in the um, uh, Comunidades Eclesiales de Base, they started really praying about this, and he really animated them um, by recognizing their gifts already present for leadership. And so as you can see in the photos here, the women started organizing caminatas for peace, peace walks in the neighborhood, and talking to some of the young men and women who were in gangs and reaching out to them, learning their names, offering food, visiting them when they went to jail, and figuring out what would it take to help you get out of the gang. The other picture is the women who started uh, cooking food and opened the parish to become a homeless shelter for those who were migrants and needed a place to stay while they figured out where to go. And, uh, and this is something that has continued now for 40 years. It continues to be a, a safe place for both homeless people and migrants. Um, and when, when they started this ministry, the women were bringing, the mothers were bringing like a cup of rice and a cup of frijoles. But if everybody brings a cup of rice and a cup of frijoles, there's enough. There's enough for everyone. So this ministry led, um, you know, the starting of these ministries eventually led to Homeboy Industries, which is now the largest gang intervention rehabilitation program in the world. This is what Catholics can do when we unleash the gifts and the baptismal calls of all of us. Everyone, everyone, everyone. This is the kind of impact we're capable of. Uh, Dolores Mission continues to be super active in uh, the homeless shelter with caminatas, uh, you know, standing for immigrants and refugees. And then the picture on the lower left uh, is Rosa Campos, one of, the, one of the earliest women who helped to get these ministries started because she will, loves talking to young people. And at the time that I was at Dolores Mission, we had up to 34 high schools and colleges, many from Jesuit high schools and Jesuit colleges, visiting us because people wanted to just be inspired about how do you put your faith into action. Anybody here, your college or high school has... Um, done an immersion program. Yes, there's a bunch. You help to, to um, inspire our community to keep going. Your visits really make a difference. So just wanted to um, thank you for that. And over the years, there's been recognition in the community of just the courageous and brave roles that the women have played. So this is a mural that Jose Ramirez painted on the side of Dolores Mission Church. And this is a mural, Mother of the Gardens, which Fabian Deborah painted in the public housing project because he wanted, after he spent numerous years in and out of prison and then reformed his life and became an East LA artist who now is painting murals all over LA, he came back to the Dolores Mission community, to Pico Gardens, and painted this mural to thank the mothers for never giving up on him and to ask for forgiveness for all the trouble he had caused. Restorative justice in art making. So one of the things that we learn from uh, the Comunidades Eclesiales de Base, the faith sharing groups that, would, that began these ministries was, what do we see in the neighborhood? Is it was see, judge, act, which is actually a model that came from Latin America. What do you see? Uh, how do you analyze this, especially by the light of your faith and by reading the Bible? And then what action are you going to take? And what I would propose is that now that we are in synod and we're trying to think what is God asking of us in the third millennium, that there's some, that seeing is not enough. It's important, but we also need to listen. So how do we see people, at, you know, who are uh, in, in need, but then how do we listen to their stories? And so that's the next thing that we're being called to do. Judge, I, now we're talking more about it as discernment. How do we discern what's happening and what is the will of the Holy Spirit? And then acting, it, you know, it no longer works to have 
people acting in a thousand different directions. How do we learn how to walk together? Because reducing the polarization that is in our country and in many countries is one of the critical issues in order for us to have an abundant future. So walking together. And so as we think about renewing diaconia, renewing the diaconate, imagine a prophetic diaconate that serves a synodal listening church that includes men and women who go out to the peripheries, share good news, and accompany people in their struggles for abundant life. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about St. Phoebe, because as we imagine this prophetic diaconate, it's not something totally new. We have a history in our church of incredible diaconia. And in our own Bible, St. Paul commends Phoebe, our sister, who is a deacon, diakonos, that's the Greek word, of the church at Sencria. She led a house church in Sencria. That you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the holy ones and help her with whatever she needs from you, for she has been a benefactor to many and to me as well. Romans 16, 1 through 2. It is one of the most beautiful affirmations of women in leadership, and it was written by St. Paul. And if you've never seen this Bible passage before, unfortunately, it is never read in the church lectionary, the cycles A, B, or C. It is never read. It's not included. She is a hidden church figure, and now we're trying to make her more visible because as we stand on the shoulders of great Catholic women leaders who helped to build the early Christian communities from the beginning. And Phoebe was incredibly brave. St. Paul was not able to deliver his letter to the Romans himself. And, he was, and so he gave this letter to Phoebe, who makes a journey of over 750 miles from Sincrea, Greece, to Rome to deliver this letter. And because she knew him, she would have helped to have interpreted as well as she, as she shares this letter with um, the Roman community. How is this relevant today? How is bravery, women's bravery, you know, being shown today? Well, I've shared with you the story of the women of Dolores Mission. And I also want to share with you the women, a little bit about the women of the Amazon. And the person you see on the upper uh, right is... Sister Laura Vicuña Pereira Manso. She is a religious sister in Porto Velho, Brazil, a very rural part of the Amazon. And she, for 20 years now, 23 years, she has been defending the human rights of indigenous people in the Amazon, as well as calling for the protection of the Amazon rainforest, which is the largest rainforest in our world, on which we all depend for quality air. The picture on the upper left, I went to visit Hermana Laura this June to see for myself what is going on in the Amazon and why have the Amazon bishops asked to be able to ordain women as deacons because so many of them are already functioning as de facto deacons and are leading the effort to protect the rights of indigenous people and, uh, and protect our common home. I got to travel by boat for two hours. We went through Caribuna territory and this 10-year-old boy is learning from his grandmother and grandfather, his mother and his father, how to protect their ancestral home and preserve it for many generations and for all the incredible biodiversity that is there. When I arrived on Caripuna territory in June, it was filled with butterflies thousands and thousands of butterflies. I had never seen anything like that before. It was like suddenly a little spark of Eden just to see how diverse parts of our world can be. About two hours later, after we crossed Garibuna territory, we began to see what you see on the lower left. 
where illegal logging and mining is just destroying parts of the Amazon because that part is not being protected by the indigenous people who have the strongest commitment to the Amazon. In June, uh, 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 Sister Laura and Jessica Patiachi and Patricia Galinda traveled all the way to Rome. Pope Francis welcomed them. He wanted to hear from them personally about the ministry they are doing in the Amazon and what is at stake. So one of the questions I would ask you is, these women are risking their lives, and would we want the sacramental grace of diaconia to be conferred upon these women just to help them in their ministry as they defend the rights of indigenous people and as well as defending the rainforest from total destruction? It's something to just pray about and consider. What difference would sacramental grace have for them if they could be ordained as deacons and recognized in that way? When we were in Rome, discerning deacons and women in ministry in the Amazon, uh, this group of women, um, we helped to organize a symposium on a synodal diaconate. And we were welcome to host the symposium at the Jesuit Curia in Rome, in the Aula. We invited synod delegates and Roman theologians and church leaders. Uh, and so we got to contribute to the discernment in a very real and practical way. So I just want to take a moment here to express my gratitude to the Jesuits for welcoming this symposium to happen at the Jesuit Curia and for signaling to our whole church that this conversation, this discernment deserves a full hearing. We can talk about this. Okay, share a couple more things before we finish here. Um, celebrating Phoebe Day, uh, this was something that we, one of the things as I mentioned to you, women, are, young women in particular, are really saying in the listening consultations, like we want more women to be able, we want women to be able to preach. We want to be able to hear gospel reflections. <laughs> we want to hear, we want to be able to hear uh, gospel reflections that reflect our lives as sisters, as mothers, as grandmothers, as daughters, as friends. And so I just want to give another shout out to Catholic Women Preach for their dedication to record hundreds of Catholic women preaching. So this year, with the support of many uh, Catholic churches, about 200 Catholic churches, schools, universities, and Catholic organizations, St. Phoebe's Feast Day is September 3rd. And so on September 3rd and throughout September, uh, we invited um, people organized celebrations to honor St. Phoebe, to raise awareness of who she was as a deacon in our early church, and where possible to invite women to offer a testimony or a reflection during a liturgy. And I know we have some young adult women here who did that. Can you just stand up if you got to offer a testimony or a reflection? <laughs> All right, I'm going to get personal for a second here. Um, just to share with you for a moment my Phoebe day. Uh, for the last three years, I, I slingshotted from LA to Miami during the pandemic to help shelter in place with my elderly widowed father to make sure he would survive the pandemic and to just help manage his care as he was experiencing declining health. I was living with my niece. Christina, then another niece showed up, Sophia, then another niece showed up, Carolina, and before we knew it, we were this intergenerational household that we called Rancho Lolo. My, <laughs> my dad's name is Manuel Jorge Hidalgo. And we built this intentional community of listening across generations. And I share this with you because while we're talking about becoming a listening church, it's not just about these key issues of our day. It also is about the listening that needs to happen in our families. Um, and 
Yep, yep, okay, that's resonating, resonating. So my dad was very sick this summer and he got into hospice care, but on, on September 3rd, uh, that picture on the, on the upper right, he rallied and he just wanted to have breakfast with us, with me and his three nieces and, and to um, just affirm the giftedness of women and of young women for ministry in the church. And I, I am just so, I wanted to share with you that that was September 3rd and on September 26th, my dad passed away. Um, right before I was heading to Rome, but I wanted, I wanted to bring him into this space because I know that what he would want to say to you all, he was so proud of the work we were doing, and I know what he would say to you all, want to say to you all is, díganles que se animan a hablar con sus mamás y papás y con sus abuelos. <laughs> so encourage them to talk with their parents and with their grandparents, with their elders and their family. Put the conversations in the, in the spirit into it to work in your own families because the the conversations we have in our families are just as important as any other okay coming to our conclusion here just to wrap up we've been talking about hashtag listening church everyone 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 conversations in the spirit walking together gente puente peace builder synod ambassador and just a reminder, right, of what we're trying to do here in the conversations in the spirit. Last night, the, syn the, the, the synthesis report was published from this month-long summit, summit to try and um, get a sense of where are we landing after a month of listening to each other. So I want to just share with you a couple of things that came out about women's participation. The synthesis report states that there was a clear request from the assembly that women's contributions would be recognized and valued and that their pastoral leadership increase in all areas. So this is a point of agreement. Now, they're not ready to move on women deacons, but this, uh, but this is the point, the place of moving forward. Theological and pastoral research on the access of women to the diaconate should be continued, benefiting from consideration of the results that the commissions that were established by the Holy Father and other historical exe exegetical research already undertaken. If possible, the results of the research should be presented to the next session of the assembly. So there's an agreement or a question, a pathway forward that we need to study the history that's already been done, and there is a lot. There's, you know, this history has been studied now for 40 years, so we have a very good foundation. But now is an opportunity where the assembly seems to be saying, we'll read it. We'll read it, we'll learn it, and what else do we need to know? So I see this as a win, that the conversation continues, and the, and the assembly will meet again next October. And we have our work. We have our work. Those of us that are part of schools and colleges and universities, okay, theological research, pastoral research, let's start figuring out what we can do to contribute to the conversation. And as students as well. So the last thing I'll share with you is in 2021, we went to the opening mass of the Global Synod and created a little delegation of uh, women from a group of six that was from Canada, the US, Brazil, and Bolivia. And um, Pope Francis was so interested in learning that the United States was participating in a delegation that included Latin America and Canada that he wanted to meet us. And so we got a chance to meet him and shared with him this image of St. Phoebe uh, delivering the St. Paul's letter to the Romans and, and proclaiming the letter to the Romans. And as the women, especially of the Amazon, shared with the, him their ministry, his words uh, were, firme adelante. Amen. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so
So I offer those words to you in conclusion, firme adelante, because the conversations in the spirit and all that we are being called to think about, you know, it's challenging. It's not easy work. But firme adelante is what allows us to, to make the most of this Kairos historical moment, to make the most of the grace, the graces that the Holy Spirit is trying to offer us, to make the most of this opportunity to, to move into the future, walking together as a beloved and boundless community. Firme adelante. So, before we head off, I want to actually just invite us to take one minute of sacred silence because every conversation in the spirit that the Synod delegates were doing always included time for silence. And so let's take a minute of silence. Let's invite the Holy Spirit in. Just think about, is there anything that I shared with you today that just resonates, something you want to remember, something that's challenging for you? So can we, take, can we just take a moment of silence together, a minute? Okay, let's do that. And now I invite you to just turn to somebody next to you and share a word or a phrase. Let's take another 30 seconds, just something that resonates with you, an action step you might want to take. Just share a word or a phrase with the, your neighbor next to you. Okay, just wrap up your thought. Thank you for your wonderful participation. Thanks for going on this journey together. Firme adelante, and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going.